Hello, welcome to SEC 5, week 17. In this week, we will uh, review for the final exam. The review guide or the study guide for the final exam has been uploaded to Canvas. And you can find the uh, study guide on Canvas in the folder files. Uh, so about the final exam, there has been a announcement on Canvas about uh, important information of the final exam. So let's uh, talk about uh, the basic information of the final exam again. So this exam will be online for sure. And uh, there will be a on Canvas. You need to log into Canvas and find the final exam and take it. And uh, the duration of the exam will be 40 minutes. So it, it will last for 40 minutes when you take it. So it means that and once you click it and start to take it, you only have 40 minutes to finish the final exam. And uh, the next, que next question is when to take it. There's no fixed time or date for this exam, but you need to take that exam between December 16th and December 18th. So you can take any time on those three days. So you have a three day period to take that exam. And once you, you start it, you only have uh, 40 minutes to finish it. So, uh, December 16th, 17th, and 18th, they are the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of the final week, uh, namely the week 18. So, uh, so that's the basic information about the final exam. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, please contact me. And uh, starting from now, we can review for the we can go over the study guide and review for the final exam. Okay. So here's a here's a study guide for the final exam. So you can see all the all the knowledge and uh, key points that you know has uh, are listed in this file, and uh, they are categorized. Uh, using uh, chapters, so this all these uh, knowledge points are summarized and listed under each chapter. So we have learned uh, thirteen chapter chapters. So chapter one, the first week of a lecture, that's a lecture in week two, is about the brief introduction of this course. So here listed some, uh, in this lecture, we talk about some basic questions, about some theories about uh, the branches of uh, some psychology topics. So for chapter one, you need to know the, some following, uh, some uh, concepts and knowledge. The first is the question that positive psychology asks. So if you look at, uh, we look at the slides, we talk about personal growth and then, we talk about uh, positive psychology. And uh, here you need to know what questions this, uh, this branch of psychology asks. So on this slide, here's the questions to ask. The first question, what, what, uh, first question is what works instead of what does not work. So in traditional psychology, uh, psychologists often ask what does not work, what's, what is wrong with people. But in positive psychology, the question to ask is what works? And uh, the next question, next question to ask is what is right with people instead of what is wrong with people? So the second question to ask is what is right with people? What people have done right or people, what people are right, why people are right, what is right with them? And the second concept that you need to know is self-actualization. It's a concept in humanistic psychology. So let's go to humanistic psychology. So 
So this slide uh, in it, it uh, introduces the, what uh, self-actualization is. Here's the definition. The tendency toward fulfilling our potential toward becoming what we are capable of becoming. So self-actualization is natural phenomenon of human beings. So any people have this tendency. They tend to fulfill their potential. They tend to become what they are capable of becoming. They just want, they just want to become, they can become. They, they just want to fulfill their potential. They have potential and they want to fulfill them. That's self-actualization. And also the next point is the person who developed the person-centered approach. So just remember the person's name. So a uh, person-centered approach is also in a part of a humanistic psychology. So yeah, Carl Rogers, uh, this, so this scholar or this uh, uh, person, this guy developed the person-centered approach, Carl Rogers. And yeah, and the next concept is actualizing, actualizing tendency, not the self-actualization, but actualizing tendency. So that, that's a concept under the person-centered approach framework. So here's the definition of actualizing tendency. So the, there is an assumption that every human is a organism. Every organism has purposes, and also every organism organism is always changing. And also, uh, organism organism has always has experiences when uh, the organism is interacting with the environment in the world. And uh, every organism has a tendency called actualizing tendency. Actualizing tendency has has a direction toward actualizing the experiences. In other words, every organism has a has a motivation or has a tendency, has a potential to have new and newer experiences. Always have newer experiences, and that that uh, uh, process never stops. So that's actualizing tendency. Okay, so the next concept is hierarchy of needs. So you need to know there are five hierarchies of needs, of human needs. That's the Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory. So you can know the five needs, what the five needs are. The, on the bottom level, that's the physiological needs. It means that the people need the basic of physical maintenance materials like food, water, and warmth, and a place to live. And also above physiological needs, there is a need for safety. People want to protect them from physical and psychological threats, such as fear and anxiety, and physical threats such as wild animals, such as natural disasters. They want to protect themselves from those physical threats and also uh, some emotional psychological threats. So that's a need for safety. And the need above safety is love and belonging. So when they are satisfied with safety needs, they're satisfied with physiological needs. They are not stop. They are not stop. Uh, they do not stop. They seek to pursue the love and belonging needs. So they want to have love. They want to be accepted. They want to be, we, they want to be loved. They want to belong to some kind of a social groups. So that's the need for love and belonging. 
the need above love and belonging is the esteem needs. Means that they want to have the achievement. They want to have the social recognition. Means that they want to be recognized by other people for their dignity, for their what, for what they have achieved, for what they are capable of doing. So that's esteem need. Above the esteem need, that's so self actualization. So that's the uh, tendency that every person has to actualize their full potential. They just want to be whatever they want to be. They just want to uh, realize all the all the potential they, that they have. So that's the, on the top level, that's self actualization. And also uh, in this theory, it, it says that uh, people pursue these needs on hierarchies. It means that uh, only if they are satisfied with the lower level needs, they start to seek the higher level needs. So first they need to satisfy with the physiological needs. When this kind of needs are satisfied, they, seek to, uh, they start to seek the satisfaction of the safety needs. And when the safety needs are satisfied, they start to seek the, uh, seek the uh, love and the belonging needs, and so forth. That's the, the theory of Maslow's. Uh, but there is a, a criticism about the theory. Uh, people, later, the psychologists later found, found that sometimes it's not that strict. Sometimes they have the, all these needs at the same time. They have the physiological needs and they have the safety needs. They have the love and the belonging needs. They have the esteem needs at the same time. Even though they are really hungry, but they also want to have uh, the safety needs. Okay, so that's the hierarchy of needs. The next two questions is fixed mindset and growth mindset. Let's go to another part. Oh uh, yeah, fixed versus growth mindset. So there are two kinds of mindsets about themselves, about people themselves. Growth mindset, uh, when people are in growth mindset, People believe that their personal qualities, their personal characteristics can be changed, can be improved. These personal qualities are malleable, means that they can be changed. It's not really fixed. Growth is really possible for them, especially for intelligence. So the, at the beginning, these two concepts come from the self-concept about people's, their own, people's own intelligence. So some people believe that they can be smarter, they can work hard and be smarter. And some people believe that, oh, they just uh, born to be smart or born to be stupid. They cannot improve their intelligence. And in growth mindset, people believe that they can improve their intelligence by working hard. And But in fixed mindset, people believe that they cannot be smarter. They're just that smart all the time. And also other for other qualities like uh, other stuff, they also believe that uh, all those personal qualities are fixed, are set, cannot be changed. So the growth of those personal qualities is not possible. So they are born to be a particular person that is always like that during the entire life. So that's the fixed mindset. And there are some consequences because of the two kinds of mindsets. Yeah, so but first you need to know uh, what the fixed mindset is, what the growth mindset, mindset is. So that is the chapter one.
Okay, so that's a review for chapter two. That's about uh, developmental psychology. That's about childhood and adolescence. And also, uh, yeah, I forgot to say that uh, there's a four for the for chapter one. It means that there are four questions for chapter one, and also for there are four chapters. Uh, there are four questions for chapter two. So let's start. Uh, Go, go over for chapter two. So first concept is, you don't know what Eric Erickson's psycho psychosocial view of human development. You don't know what it is. So that's a theory developed by Eric Erickson about how uh, children develop during their uh, childhood and adolescence. So uh, there's a, a assumption about uh, Erickson's psychosocial view of human development. He believed that uh, the self grows. The self is developing through interactions with the social and cultural environment, with other people in the society, in the environment. And also, uh, people in different stages, they need to go over, they need to overcome they need to finish different tasks. So there are stages, there are eight stages of demand. In every stage, people have different tasks to finish. And also at the same time, when they are interacting with the environment, they meet the crisis because the tasks are not that easy. They are challenging, they are difficult. If they, are, if they cannot finish the tasks, they may meet the, uh, they may scratch, uh, struggle. They may meet uh, the crisis. So here is the uh, Erickson psychosocial stages of development, uh, the eight stages. You can uh, review for each of the stages. Okay, so that's Erickson's psychosocial view of human development. And another important theory to know about is attachment theory. Yeah, so here it, it introduced the attachment theory. So uh, in that theory, it, it states that when people are young, really young, before uh, three years old, there is a psychological and emotional connection between uh, the baby, between the infant and the, the caregiver. So that's, that connection, that emotional bond is very, very strong. And also why uh, attachment, that's called attachment, so that uh, the babies are attached to the caregivers. The caregivers can be parents, can be other people who take care of the babies. And the attachment for everyone is very important because it's a framework to understand close relationships. So how do every person understand what relationship is? Why to build relationships? That comes from the attachment. And also having a emotional bond is very critical for survival for anybody any baby's survival. Without attachments, the baby may not survive because the baby, when the baby is born, uh, the baby lacks a lot of uh, s skills to survive. Lacks the skill to, to eat, lacks the skills to drink, lacks the skills to make a living. So uh, the caregivers must uh, take care of the babies. So there needs to be an emotional bond between the caregiver and the, the baby. And also when they grow up, when the children grow up, they internalize the patterns of early relationships. That patterns of early relationships come from attachment. So attachment later becomes the patterns of relationships. And the, the children internalize them. It means that they 
just build every relationship later on based on the attachment, based on the pa- based on the pattern of attachment with the caregiver. So those patterns, those attachment styles, become the blueprints for future relationships. So there are uh, three kinds of uh, attachment styles. The first one is ideal one. That's a, called a secure attachment. Uh, in this kind of style, the child, the, the baby, sees the caregiver as a secure base. So that the, the caregiver is a source of security. The, ch- the child thinks that, oh, when the caregiver is present, I'm secure, I'm safe. I can explore the world environment safely. So the child, for most of the time, is really happy and active. Uh, but there are other kinds of attachment styles that are not really ideal. One of them is anxious and ambivalent attachment. The other is anxious avoidant attachment. In an anxious uh, ambivalent attachment, the child does not see the caregiver as a skill base. The child is uh, upset with the caregiver. The, ch- the child wants to, want to receive the sense of the security from the caregiver, but the child cannot because uh, the, the caregiver may be uh, not that reliable. So the child is really anxious, is anxious about uh, the caregiver may leave or may not provide the security to the child. So uh, the child is very has has a very ambivalent attitude toward a caregiver. And for the next type is uh, anxious avoidant attachment. So as same thing, the child does not see the caregiver as a secure base, but it's different from ambivalent attachment style. The child totally ignores or avoids the caregiver because the child is totally disappointed with the caregiver, does not think the caregiver can provide any security to the, to the baby, to the child. So uh, the baby avoids the caregiver, does not want the caregiver. Uh, for these two types, the children do not explore the world, do not explore the environment because they do not have a sense of the security. Yeah, so that's the three types of attachment. Okay, yeah, that's also listed in the study guide. So you, you need to know each of them. You need to know what the, each of them is. So, so that's attachment theory and the three types of attachment styles. And the next one is characteristics of early childhood. So early childhood is from age two to six. That is corresponding to Erickson's stage two and uh, stage three. So the characteristics of the, the early childhood stage includes all this. So the main theme of this stage is to learn to be autonomous, to take initiatives. They want to be autonomous. They want to like um, be responsible for their own lives. They want to be uh, independent from other people. They do not want to rely on other people. They want to do something for themselves. So, and also they engage in playing. That's the major characteristics of uh, early child children. And also the, uh, yeah, you can see all these characteristics are the, the all these characteristics of early childhood. And uh, there's next one is the, uh, you know, the characteristics of adolescence. Adolescence is from age 13 to 20. That's corresponding to 
Erickson stage five, identity versus confusion. So they start to really socialize and integrate it into the entire society. So characteristic of this stage, yeah, it's really critical to develop identity. They, they want to find out who they are in the society. They want to find out what is the position in the, so, in the society, in the social environment. And also they explore the different roles and also they form gender identities and they learn to have the intimate in relationships with other people instead of just having relationships with uh, parents or with uh, be friends with other peers. Not only that, just they want to have intimate relationships with other people. And starting from this stage, they are more influenced by the groups instead of parents. And also there is a process called individuation going on in this uh, stage. They started to be separated from the family system and build up their own identity. They become the uh, separate individuals in the society. So these are the characteristics of uh, the adolescents. Okay, so that's a review for chapter three. It's about adulthood and uh, autonomy. So first of all, know about this concept, autonomy. What is autonomy? So uh, for last chapter, the early child, early children want to be autonomous. They want to learn how to be a autonomous person. So what is autonomy? What is autonomous person? So autonomy can be viewed as a sign for psychological maturity. So autonomy, uh, when the person is autonomous, is truly autonomous, the person accepts the responsibility for their own consequences. They make choices and cho every choice has consequences. And they know that they're responsible for all these consequences. So that's the meaning of autonomy. It means that they make choices, they bear the consequences of those choices. They do, they do not complain about that. They do not think that uh, uh, they make choices, other people take the responsibility, but they think that they take the responsibility for their own choices. Uh, also for others, to treat others, they collaborate with others, they connect, trust, respect, and show empathy, and communicate with others. They think that other people are also autonomous. Other people are also responsible for their own choice, for their own uh, choices. So that's the meaning of autonomy. And the next concept is life scripts. So life scripts is more like a, a metaphor. It's like a, the scripts for, for everybody's life. Because uh, people, when they, people grow and uh, develop, they internalize a lot of values and beliefs and behavioral patterns and even emotional patterns from parents or from any kind of caregivers. So those beliefs, values, behavioral patterns become the scripts for people's life. And also from kind of a, from culture, from the early decisions that may, they make, so those things become the identity and uh, those things in, are incorporated into the self-concept. They become what people are. So these things become the life scripts, become the scripts of life. It means that for everyone, 
the per, uh, he or she must uh, live based on the last scripts. Here's examples in the textbook, such as older people are to be honored and respected. And another example is always obey your parents and grandparents. So those are life scripts, either from culture or from the parental teachings. Okay, so next concept is injunction. So injunction is related to life scripts. So the injunctions are the messages and beliefs and values that are internalized in their mind, in their self-concept from the parents or from the uh, culture. So some kind of the beliefs and values are injunctions. For example, uh, there is an injunction called, uh, I'm a person who does not make mistakes. So that's the injunction. And there's some, there are some examples of injunctions. And the next concept is, is called a, is a therapy to cure the emotional and the cognitive problems. It's called a rational emotive behavioral therapy or REBT. You can know about this. Therapy is called is a cognitive therapy. So it's a therapy that overcome the influences from the injunctions. There here's an assumption about this uh, therapy. It assumes that the reasons for why people have emotional and behavioral problems is the inaccurate and irrational beliefs in childhood. When children are young, they have beliefs that are not right, not accurate, and not rational. Those beliefs are not rational. It's not, that doesn't make sense. Those, those beliefs do not make sense. Because children have those beliefs, when they grow up, when they grow up, they are not conscious. They are not aware. They still have them. So that those beliefs create continuously create emotional and behavioral problems. Here's a specific pattern for for this process. The first step is that the a event occurs, and the second step is there is a belief. There is a belief that is. They want to explain this event. They want to explain why this event occurs. So there is a belief about that event. And they have they start to have this belief. And they grow up. And uh, the third step is that they have the emotional problems because of this belief. So the the task, the major goal of this therapy is to cut the connection between the uh, first step and the second step, between the event and the, the belief about the event. So the belief is not right. There is a wrong belief about that event. That event occurs, that's, that's the truth, that's the reality, but uh, children can have a different belief about that event. So in the irrational emotive behavioral therapy, they uh, try to the therapists try to help the clients to build to recognize oh this belief is not right is not rational. It helps the clients to build up new beliefs about that event. <coughs> okay, so next. Uh, uh, Next concept is called inner parents. Inner parents is also a metaphor, I think. It's the, it, there is, it's like a, 
there is there is a phenomenon and that it seems like there is a parent that is living in our mind because we are always have a feeling that of uh, the parent is criticizing us is uh, judging us is talking to us because we have learned the attitudes and beliefs about ourselves and others from parents so we are in heavily influenced by our parents when we when they are when we are young and when we grow up we internalize those attitudes and beliefs so oftentimes in our mind there is a image or our of our parents that is talking to us that is uh, interacting with us in our mind when something happens so it seems like there is a inner part in our mind. So that's the phenomenon of inner part. And the next concept is a mindfulness. So mindfulness is a good way to overcome life script, overcome injunction, to overcome uh, inner critic or inner part. So mindfulness is a, a, a state of mind. In that state, people are aware of any kinds of the information at the present moment without judging, without distorting those information. So there are huge amounts of information inside and outside our, our body. And those information comes to our mind. We just accept them. We do not judge them. We do not distort them. We do not extort, ignore them. We just accept them, accept all the information. We do not judge them. We do not value, evaluate, oh, this information is right. That information is not right. We do not do that when they are mindful. We just accept all the information. We, uh, we accept all, every piece of information. We do not uh, do anything to them. So that's the mind of mindfulness. So uh, there's more about mindfulness in chapter five. So we should know what mindfulness is. So that's the content for chapter three. Okay, so let's start to review for chapter four. It's about wellness and uh, body, your physical body. So first of all, you need to know what is wellness. Wellness is a, a lifestyle choice. It's a choice that people make to have a particular type of lifestyle. And, and uh, in that lifestyle, people is responsible for the physical, mental, and the spiritual health. And also in that kind of a lifestyle, person takes uh, take the actions to enhance the physical, mental, and the spiritual health. So the person is responsible and also take actions to uh, take care of their own needs at all levels of functioning. So it means that uh, they, they take care of the needs for physical health. They take care of the needs for mental and spiritual health. They, are, they want to be physical and uh, psychological and mentally and also spiritually healthy. So that's wellness. And the next question, uh, next concepts to know about is the benefits of sleep. Yeah, so the benefits, the benefits of sleep is, can be found here. So the body can be regenerated can be the body can be refreshed from sleep and also without enough amount of sleep people can recover from stress 
And also with enough sleep, you can have energy to work. Also, sleep is good for attention. It's good for thinking. It's good for intelligence. It's good for uh, emotional management because if the sleep is deprived or there is enough, there's not enough sleep, people are easily to get upset. They cannot manage their emotion web very well. They are really stressed. They cannot pay attention. They cannot uh, really concentrate on thinking of some, some stuff. And also they are not creative. They are not productive. So without enough sleep, there are a lot of consequences. But with enough sleep, people are energetic. People can uh, can manage their emotions very well, and so forth. So that's the benefits of sleep. Yeah, yeah. So and also you know the consequences of sleep deprivation. So when the sleep is deprived or there's not enough sleep, what may happen? And the next key point to know is the benefits of exercise. Yeah, we can see from here. Here are all the benefits of fitness or exercise. There can be more sleep. There is better nutritional health. There is uh, higher resistance to infectious disease. There's lower risk of cancers. There is reduced risk of heart disease. There is stronger circulation and lung function. There is a reduced level of anger, tension, and anxiety. Increased level of well-being and also self-esteem. There's uh, also it uh, can prevent weight gain. It provides the buffer against stress. It provides a source of enjoyment. So all kinds of uh, benefits can come from exercising. Interesting. And the next concept to know about is spirituality. So spirituality is a phenomenon in our minds. It, it builds up a connection to the universe. There is a connection between the universe and the, the self. And also with spirituality, people can find the meaning in life and also find the purpose in life. And also spirituality brings a lot of benefits such as health, such as calmness, such as well-being, purpose in life, meaning in life. So that is spirituality. And also the next one is reasons for why people do not accept their body image and body weight. So we can find the reasons for why, find answers for this question later. Yeah, so that's that's the why. So sometimes people cannot accept their body weight or body image, not because their body is really heavy or the, their body image is not is really not that well, but just because they cannot accept themselves. So body image and body weight just uh, is just a specific. It's just a, a specific thing that with that thing that uh, people is able to not accept themselves. So just one accept that uh, one aspect, the body image is just the one aspect that people cannot accept themselves. They, they probably do not accept themselves in other aspects as well. Yeah, because they think they are inferior. They are inferior compared to others, so they cannot accept themselves. So
so that they cannot accept the body image. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to chapter five about uh, managing stress. So all about uh, all the topics are about are about uh, stress for this week. So first of all, what is stress? Stress is yeah. So the the strain. So that's the psychological strain, the feeding of psychological strain. So it's a it's like an emotional reaction to some threats in in the in life in the environment. That's stress. So what are the sources of stress? The stress come from can come from the uh, environment. Any events are frustrating or unhealthy, such as uh, air pollution, noise, unhealthy lifestyles, such as poor sleeping habits or over drinking, or some undesired events, such as traffic jams. All these factors from events, uh, environments that are really frustrating can cause stress. And also stress come from the uh, in the world, from our minds, from the feeling of frustration. We want to do something, but we have difficulties. We cannot do that. So we are really frustrated. That causes stress also. And the next uh, key point is three types of internal conflicts. Yeah, it's here. Sometimes they, there are different kinds of motivation, but they are incompatible. It means that people cannot achieve all the information at the same time. There are three types of uh, internal conflicts. Approach, approach conflict. It's a situation that people want two things, but they can only get one. And uh, the second type is avoidance avoidance conflict, means that uh, people uh, want neither of the two things, but they have to get one. They want to avoid all, this, all the two things, both of the two things, but they have to get one. And uh, the third type is approach avoidance conflict, And that's the conflict that they must choose between the two things, but the two things have both positive and negative elements. So no thing, neither of these two things is perfect. Both of the two things have both positive and negative sides. So they must uh, choose one of them. That's the approach avoidance conflict. And the next one is fight or flight response. So fight or flight response creates stress. So that's a major uh, process, major physical process that creates stress. So fight or flight response means that uh, uh, when the stress is there and people, our physical body has a reaction to to the stress. So uh, these two the person to either make a decision to run away from the threat or make a decision to fight with the stress or face the directly face with the stress. And uh, there are a lot of the consequences of fight or flight response. Or there's a consequences of stress. So first of all, the stress hormones release. There are different kinds of, there are a few types of hormones are that are responsible for creating the fight or flight response. And also at the same time, there are some side effects of those hormones. The, the, the side effects can be psychosomatic disorders, such as inflammation, 
vulnerable immune, immune system, hypertension. People are too nervous. Their bodies are too nervous. They cannot get relaxed because of the stress hormones. And also physical illness, illness such as cancer, headaches, and the cardiovascular disease. And then maybe a shorter life. And also some psychological and emotional consequences. Anxiety, chronic stress. Chronic stress means that there are no, no events that cause stress, but people just have stress because they're stressed all the time. And they, they cannot recover from stress anymore. And there's burnout. Yeah, also on the study guide, there is a need to know the definition of burnout. It's a, it's a long term reaction, it's a reaction to long term stress. It's a, a state of exhaustion. So physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, spiritual exhaustion, and intellect, intellectual exhaustion. So physical body is always tired, chronic fatigue, really weak. Physical body is really weak. The mind is really weak and also does not have energy. So the physical exhaustion, the feelings of helpless, and hopelessness, they're, they're feeling hopelessness. So the, that's the emotional exhaustion. And uh, they also, they do not have the energy to have those really strong emotions. They want to be angry, but uh, they cannot. They're, they're strained. They're, ex they're exhausted. And also, they, have, they cannot concentrate on the tasks. So that's the interaction of exhaustion. So all kinds of exhaustion. That's burnout. And uh, other concepts such as resilience. So resilience is a person's capacity to bounce back from stress events. So people are stressed because of the stressful events. But if people, if people are really resilient, they can quickly recover from those stressful events. They can quickly bounce back from that state. But some people are not, who are not resilient, they cannot bounce back from the major events really quickly. They may go, go over longer periods of uh, having stress. And why people are resilient and why some people are not resilient? Because those resilient people are hardy. So that involves concept of hardiness. So some people are hardy and some people are not that hardy. So hardy people have three characteristics. First of all, they, are, they like the challenges. Uh, the, instead of uh, avoiding challenges, they like the challenges. We like the stress. Uh, it's an opportunity, opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to have more exciting experiences. So they like the challenges. And the second, they, the hardy people are having a strong sense of commitment. They have goals and they are really committed to realize the goals they have. And also the third characteristic is of hardy people is that uh, they have a internal locus of control. Uh, that's the belief that they can influence life events. They can determine their own destiny. They can, they can control life instead of being controlled by life. That's internal locus of control. And the next con uh, concept is meditation. So that involves the strategies to manage stress, how to reduce stress. One of them is, there are a bunch of them. There, one of them is meditation. So that's activities that uh, people withdraw attention from the external world, but uh, pay attention to the inner world. So it's a deep state of relaxation. So they are not attracted, distracted from the 
information come coming from the external world. They just pay attention to the inner world. They are just pay attention to what they really feel and think. And they are deeply relaxed. That's the meditation. And also mindfulness, we have reviewed this in chapter three. So mindfulness is also a way to manage stress. Okay, so that's all the stuff about uh, chapter five, managing stress. Okay, next chapter about love. And in this chapter, there are three questions. And there are two things that you need to know about love. First thing is the characteristics of authentic love. So, or the real love. So what is the real love? What is the authentic love? From these characteristics, you can tell what the real love is. So know the person. Really know about the person. Understand the strength. Understand the feelings and thoughts about that person. And care about, really care about the person. Respect the person. Respect that the person is ha, also has dignity, also ha, want to be respected. And make a commitment to the person that uh, that is loved. Yeah, willing to stay with the other in the future. Trust the person. And uh, want the person to be present, want the person to be nearby, but not addicted to the person. Means that uh, uh, when the person is not present, we are also fine. We are we are totally fine when the person we love is not there. We are not attached to them. And also, when we love, really love someone, we allow that that one that person is not perfect person. Also has weaknesses. Also have a lot of the uh, weaknesses. And also. Uh, give love freely it means that uh, uh, we just love that person no matter what. We do not make changes. We not we do not make exchanges. We do not say that uh, if that one is like a, is doing something, so I so I love the love that person. No, it's not like no matter what the person does, no matter what the person is like, I love that person. And also, I uh, when we really love someone, we do not control the other. So love is not control. When we want to control their behaviors or thoughts or emotions, that's not love. And also, uh, real love can help the people to grow, both of us, both the person who love and the person is loved. There can be other characteristics of real love, but the key thing is that uh, we, uh, is this, is the stuff that we talk about. And also we need to know the characteristics of inauthentic love. So the fake love. That's totally the opposite of uh, authentic love. So in the fake love, in or in the inauthentic love, control the person. Do not respect the person. Do not accept the the real image of that person. But we want the person to do particular behaviors. We want the person is like particular is having have a particular image. We do not have a trust toward that person. We do not have a commitment. We are not willing to share. We are, do not want to forgive that person because we do not accept that person. So that's inauthentic love. So that's all the stuff for, for this chapter. Actually, there are other, a lot of other things for this chapter, but 
the stuff covered in the exam will be the uh, the two items. Okay, so let's review for chapter seven about relationships. Also, there are three uh, three questions in the final exam in from this chapter. So, in the, in the following college uh, knowledge characteristics of meaningful relationships. Let's see. Characteristics of uh, meaningful relationships. In a meaningful and a high quality relationship, people have separate identities. It means that they are separate. They are not together. They are not one, one person, but there's different people. And uh, they are equal. There, there is no uh, like a hierarchy among the relationships among these people who have the meaningful relationships, and also people give the honest and respectful feedback to toward each other, and also they are responsible for their own happiness. They will not think that their own happiness is uh, is uh, is is because of others. They, they think that they are responsible for the, their own happiness. They are happy because of themselves. Uh, they are not happy also because of themselves, not because of the, uh, the other one in the relationship. And also, people do not expect the other to do something for them. And they can enjoy something together. There are more th stuff like uh, they can find the meaning outside of the re this relationship. So this relationship is just part of their own life. And because the relationship, each person is better in the relationship. And also they decide to be together because they choose to do so, which want to be together instead of have to be together. And they encourage, encourage the other, each other to be the self. They can be the real self in this relationship. And also they are able to deal with the conflict in the meaningful relationship. So these are all the characteristics of meaningful relationship or high quality relationship. There can be other, uh, other things as well, but uh, these are at least part of the characteristics of meaningful relationship. And the next one is the guidelines to manage conflicts and anger. So that's an interesting question. So how to manage conflicts and anger? So there are some guidelines from the steps. The first one is to treat confrontation as caring act. How to treat that as caring act? Really listen and understand what the other person says. Really understand it. And uh, identify your own motivation. Clarify your own in intentions. And also talk about how uh, behavior affects you rather than how they are. So just talk about how their in behaviors affect you instead of just the personality of uh, them. And also other uh, steps, other things that uh, you can do. So do not plan the next response when the other is speaking. So the same is really listen on the sense. Do not think about other stuff when other is speaking. And also responsible for your own feelings means that uh, do not expect that uh, other people will be responsible for your own feelings. You, so you, what kind of feelings you have is because you have those feelings, not because other people make them make you have those feelings. Yeah, also tell the others how you are struggling, that the other know about you, understand you. And also don't walk away from conflict, Con uh, deal with conflict instead of the 
escape, escape from the conflict. And also next one is uh, the suggestions to effective communication is similar to the guidelines to manage conflicts. So the sessions of to effective communication really listen and understand. So it's the same with the the step to manage conflict. Uh, so the ideal situation is that you can accurately summarize what the speaker says just now. So that's yeah yeah. With that you can really listen and understand what the other says. And use some specific and really con concrete words. Do not use some really fuzzy and uh, vague words that people cannot really understand you. And also make personal statements rather than ask too many questions. And next suggestion is do not judge. Do not judge the worth or the quality of that person. Just talk about the specific events, talk about the behaviors of uh, everybody has done. And then honest and direct, respect for the difference. And also, uh, you need to you need to behave in a way that uh, your verbal and nonverbal language are congruent, so they are consistent. When you say something happy, you smile, so that's congruence. And also open, be open to express the feelings because with the expressions of feelings, other people can understand you and you can understand the other people. So these are the contents in chapter seven. So, uh, so let's go to chapter eight. It's about gender, about two genders or two sexes. Uh, so that's there. Actually, there is that content in this chapter. So there are two. There will be two questions in the final exam. So know about this concepts or college. So first of all, is gender. Gender is the uh, is a is a uh, is a feeling. It's not a really physical characteristic is a feeling, a subjective feeling of being male or being female. Uh, sex is about the biological characteristic of the physical body, but gender is a cultural phenomenon or is a psychological phenomenon. It's identity and a perception about self. So the person may be identify he or herself as a, a male or female. So that's about the personal identity and the perception. And also we have the knowledge of the gender when we grow up. So it's not something that we have at first place, but we learn to be male or female. So that's gender. And also, yeah, second thing is difference between gender and sex. And uh, the third one is uh, stereotypes of men. So all these are stereotypes about males or men. So stereotype is a, a really fixed belief that uh, uh, in that kind of belief, um, all, the, all the people in that group should have particular characteristics, but it might not be true. So stereotypical views, for men of males, first of all, emotionally unavailable it means that uh, they, they do not have emotions toward other people. And also they must be independent. The males must be powerful and aggressive, but it's, it might not be true. Some people, some males are not powerful. They are not aggressive. And uh, men have no fear, fear have no fear. 
That's not true either. They hide the true self. They have no bodily awareness. They must succeed at work. They deny any kind of feminine qualities, such as expressing emotions. So that all these are still typical view of man. And there's no physical contact between men, between, between males. That's also a stereotype. So all these are stereotypes of men. And others are stereotypes of women. Yeah, so uh, women need to be warm, they need to be expressive, means that they want to, they need to express the, the feelings very often. And uh, they must be nurturing. They must uh, nurture the children or other people. They cannot be assertive. They cannot be independent. independent. Uh, yeah, they cannot uh, do something that are not feminine. They cannot deviate, deviate from their female role. They need to be interested in relationships rather than achievements or professional accomplishments. There can be other stereotypes of um, females. For example, uh, females should have less salaries compared to men in the workplace. That's also a stereotype. So you can know the, uh, you just know the stereotypes of women, women the stereotypes of women. So that's it. There's, there's less content actually in this chapter. So let's go to uh, chapter nine about sexuality. There are less content here too in this chapter. So there are two questions. There will be two questions in the chapter. Uh, two concepts to know, know about. One is mutual empathy. The other is intimacy intimacy so mutual empathy means the awareness that each person cares for the other and then knows that this care is reciprocated so that's mutual empathy and intimacy Next, let's see intimacy. Intimacy is a feeling. It's a deep level of caring for another person. So in the close relationships, people have intimacy between each other. So that's a really deep feeling of caring for others, for the other person. Sometimes people in sexual relationships have the intimacy. And sometimes the people in the sexual relationship, they do not have intimacy. They are they do not see each other as the intimate per person. They do not see each other as really close, but they have sex with each other. So that's intimacy. Okay, so let's go to the next chapter. Okay, so in chapter 10, it's about work and recreation. There will be three questions in the final exam. So uh, first of all, know the factors to, cons to consider when making a career decision. So what kind of the factors need to consider when you need to make a career decision? You need to think about the attitudes about certain occupations. You need, to talk, uh, you need to think about, consider the abilities and uh, the potential abilities that you, you have. You need to think, oh, can I do this? Can I, uh, be, can I be successful in this, uh, in this role? And also you need to think about the values, the work values you have. And you need to think about the motivation that you have when you do the work. You need to think about the interests that you have. When you are not interested in the work, you, you may suffer from the work because you are not interested. If you are interested in the work that you, you choose, you are probably be really happy because you are doing something that you like to do every day. So you need to talk, think about your interests. 
And also, you need to think about who you are. Think about your, you, what kind of, what type of person you are. So, uh, yeah. So it's related to the Hollanders. Holland, Holland's uh, six type person personality types. So yeah, so you can see it. You can these two, these three slides are really helpful. You can read the this table here, and here and here. Yeah, this figure here, and the tables in these two slides know about the six types of personality types defined by John Holland. There is in fact investigate investigative this kind of people are like ideas like abstract ideas like to investigate uh, like to to do research and also there's artistic type uh, people are really creative really artistic and also there's social type people are like to social like to interacting with other people and also there's enterprising type they focus on finishing the task they focus on organizing other people and form a team and realize the goals that we want to achieve. That's enterprising type. And also there's a conventional type. They like the order. They like to be uh, they like to be really organized, very disciplined stuff. I, I like everything is in order. And there's a realistic type. They like the things. They like to make things. They like to deal with things with their hands. They like the physical, I mean the physical things, such as techniques, such as engineers. They like to deal with things. So these are six personality types. OK. And Next concept to know is leisure. So what is leisure? Leisure is a concept is that is in contrast with work. So leisure is the moment that people use time to do what people they want to do. They want to do that thing and they do that. They use the time. So that's leisure. There's in leisure, they control the time instead of uh, being controlled by by the work by the time. There are some benefits of leisure. So the stress can be reduced because the work may create a stress. So outside of work, they reduce the stress. They want they can do whatever they want to do. So their stress can be reduced. They can find the meanings outside of work, and also that's a chance for themselves to express themselves. They can express themselves through doing something that they really want to do. And also creates a balance in life. There's not only work, but there's also leisure in life. So that's all the stuff that you need to review for chapter 10. Okay, so let's go to uh, chapter 11, loneliness and solitude. So there are two questions in the in the final exam. So there's less content two in the in this chapter. So know about the two concepts, loneliness and the solitude. So loneliness is a feeling of being lonely. So uh, means that uh, no people are around. We can I cannot to. I cannot interact with other people in the environment, so I feel lonely. That's a sense of have to. So it means that I, the situation makes me to feel lonely. I do not want want to feel lonely, but other people are away. I'm separated from other people, so I feel lonely. And solitude is another type of being alone. Loneliness and solitude are both being alone, but loneliness is a negative feeling of being alone. It's a, it involves a sense of have to, but solitude involves a sense of want to. 
sometimes people want to be alone. They do not want to be with others. They want to be quiet. They want to be alone. So that's solitude. They uh, intentionally make some time to be alone. So why they want to be alone? Some, there are some benefits from solitude. First of all, they have the chance to re-examine their life. So they want to have a reflection of their own life. So they choose to be alone so they can be quiet and do the reflection. Uh, also, they can know themselves better through solitude. And also, they can away from others. They can away from the intensity of intimacy. Sometimes it's too intimate. They feel that they're too intimate with other people. They want to keep away from that for a while. So they choose to be in solitude. So that's the cool concepts that you know. And the, 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 the third concept that you know is shyness, both uh, definition and the characteristics. So shyness is the feeling of the discomfortable feeling because of the interpersonal relationships. So there's a discomfort, there's anxiety, there's inhibition. There's excessive caution in interpersonal relationships. So they are not comfortable with interpersonal relationships. They are not comfortable with interacting with other people. They're really anxious. They are sometimes they inhibited their own behaviors. Yeah, there are some characteristics of Chinese. First of all, they're overly sensitive to something happen in the in the social interactions. They're easily to be embarrassed because they are over because they are overly sensitive, so that they are easily embarrassed, and also they are highly self-conscious. They are always monitoring their own behaviors and uh, uh, things to say because they are really sensitive. Sometimes they want to do something, but they stop themselves doing those. So that's inhibited behavior. They inhibit themselves doing something because they think that all oh, those things are not appropriate. They, they should not do that in the social situations. And there are some bodily symptoms such as muscle tension, such as increased heart rate. There, there are two numbers. So that's uh, these are characteristics of the shyness. And let's go to the next chapter. Next chapter is death and uh, loss. So also two, two questions in the final exam. The concept to know, the first one is five stages of dying. So first stage, when people are about to die, so what they can go through. So first of all, they deny themselves. They deny the fact that they were dying very soon. And the second, they they accept the fact, but they are angry because they want do not want to die, but they will die, so they are angry. And the third stage is that uh, they bargain with somebody uh, to have more time to live. So they want to bargain with somebody or with uh, some supernatural being for getting more time to live. So give up some resources having more time to live, but it's not useful. They're still going to die. And the fourth, uh, next stage is depression. They're really depressed because they found that no matter if they are angry or deny or bargain, neither of this, none of this is useful. So they are really depressed. And finally, they, are ex they accept the fact they accept the reality that uh, everybody is going to die and they are going to die very soon. So these are five stages of dying. And the ne next concept is grief and also mourning. Grief is the feeling 
experienced by uh, by the uh, after the situation that uh, there's a significant loss. Some people, some family member died, or uh, the pet is lost, and the pet is dead, or uh, some really uh, important things are uh, missing. So there's a significant loss, and the people have a have a feeling of grief. In the process of grief, people are sad, they're painful, they do not accept the fact. Yeah. That's uh, more about internal feeling. It's more about emotional reaction to the significant loss. So, so that's grief. And another uh, concept is mourning. Mourning is also a reaction to a significant loss, but it's a, like an external expression of the internal grief, expression of the sadness and the pain. So that's mourning. It involves behaviors, involves rituals, involves, a, uh, involves uh, some kind of social activities, such as uh, uh, some rituals. Yeah, such as funeral. So funeral is a process of a mourning. So mourning is some external expression, but grief is internal feeling because of the significant loss. So let's go to the last chapter. That chapter is about meaning and values. There are also two questions in the final exam. So three concepts to know about. The first one is philosophy of life. So that's the uh, philosophy of life. Everybody has it. Uh, in the philosophy of life, there are some beliefs, attitudes, and values that are really fundamental, really basic to a person. And those beliefs, attitudes, and values can control a person's behaviors, can govern the person's behaviors. People do something because of these beliefs, attitudes, and values. There can be some values, work values or life values. It can be uh, like um, some moral standards. People are honest, people do not lie because we have such a philosophy of life. That's really fundamental to people's life. And also values. So values are core beliefs that influence how people act. So values are not just beliefs. That's the core beliefs that heavily influence how people act. So these are values. And the next uh, thing to know about is approaches to find meaning in life. So there are there can be different strategies. First, for example, uh, we can be spiritual. We have talked about spiritual in uh, managing stress chapter. So we can have a connection with the universe, with the world. We can ask the ultimate questions for why we are living in this world. We can have a connection with the supernatural beings. And also we can have some uh, basic spiritual values such as love, compassion. With those, we can easily to find a meaning. And we can connect with others by embracing, uh, embracing the diversity, embracing the fact that we are all different from each other. We can connect with others uh, by being aware of uh, that uh, there are a lot of stereotypes, prejudice, and racism existing in people's minds. We are aware that, oh, those are not really reality. Uh, we can have connections with our others without having those beliefs and attitudes. We can pursue some social, in social interests. We can not only, we can pursue our personal interests. We are interested in something that we pursue them, but we can 
do something for other people, for the society, for the for the good of other people, for the good of the whole society. So with that, we can find a meaning in life. And also we can develop ourselves. We can be better so we can find a meaning in life. The meaning in life is becoming better, is becoming whatever we want to be. To realize self-actualization, to actualize ourselves, such as reading, such as writing journals, such as going to counseling sections, so we can develop ourselves. So, uh, yeah, I think these are all the stuff to review. Yeah, I'm impressive. So like how how much stuff and knowledge that we have learned during this semester. And today we have talked. We I have over have talked about so much stuff. That's there are thirteen chapters, and we have known so much stuff. And uh, hopefully. This review is not just for the final exam. That's not uh, the only meaning for taking the exam and also uh, reviewing. So I think the real meaning of reviewing for the final exam is that we can like uh, solidate the knowledge that we have. We can review and have a more uh, more more solid foundation of this knowledge. We can really learn and understand this knowledge and the information. So I think that's the real meaning of reviewing for the final exam. So you can take the exam as a, a really a test of whether you have know this information or knowledge. But the reviewing process is the real thing to do. Yeah, and this knowledge is not just uh, something that you never use later in life, but I think this knowledge is really useful in your life. So you can tell that in this class, is all this information is really useful in everyday life. It's not really created. This class is not really created for some really specialized professional occupation like engineering or math, but it's created for just everybody's life, general life. And uh, everyone can benefit from this knowledge. And uh, I, I hope you can uh, re review this knowledge carefully, especially the, the key points uh, listed in this uh, study guide. And uh, thank you so much for watching this video and uh, hope you have a really good experience in the final exam for this class, for this uh, semester. And bye-bye. Uh,